Madam President, uh, let me take the moment to uh, welcome you to the United States Senate, and I look forward to working with you. Uh, welcome from the House of Representatives of the United States Senate. Madam President, um, over the Christmas holidays, uh, much of our nation was focused on uh, what Congress would do to avoid the so-called fiscal cliff. What was largely missing from that conversation was how to address the much greater and more damaging problem, our growing national debt. Not exactly sure what the definition of fiscal cliff was. I think it had different meanings to different people. We dealt with a portion of the fiscal cliff, a uh, slight delay in sequestration and the consequences of the so-called Bush tax cuts expiring on December the 31st. But the problem, the serious problem, is our national debt. Last year's budget shortfall reached $1.1 trillion, the fourth straight year of trillion-dollar deficit spending. This out-of-control government spending has increased our national debt to a record $16 trillion, which is more than the entire U.S. economy produced in goods and services in the entire year of 2012. Last week, Secretary Geithner notified Congress that government will reach its borrowing limit as soon as mid-February. So President Obama will request Congress to raise the debt ceiling once again. This is the fifth time the President, has, President Obama has requested the debt limit be raised to allow the federal government to borrow and spend more money. But what is the point of even having a debt limit if Congress simply extends the Treasury's borrowing capacity each time the limit is reached? While some may say that it's irresponsible not to raise the debt limit, our nation finds itself at a point of such indebtedness that it is equally as irresponsible to extend the debt ceiling without significant reductions in federal spending. I voted against an increase to the debt limit two years ago and intend to vote against another increase unless we substantially change the way that government does business by reducing federal spending. In addition to it being alleged that it's irresponsible not to raise the debt ceiling, sometimes it's suggested that it's not compassionate to not spend money. Where is the compassion in spending money that we don't have that's being borrowed and will have to be repaid by future generations of Americans, kids and grandkids? Our country is facing enormous fiscal challenges that, if left unchecked, will have a disastrous impact on the future of our nation. The simple truth is that government is spending more than it's taking in, and this pattern must not, cannot, in fact, continue. During the last two years alone, the government has spent more than $7.3 trillion and increased the nation's debt by more than $3.2 trillion. We didn't get into this situation overnight. It's been years in the making. Our stagging, staggering national debt and deficits are the responsibility of many Congresses and Presidents from both political parties who have allowed us to live well beyond our means for far too long. Americans deserve leadership in Washington to confront these fiscal challenges and fight for the future of our nation. But to date, our President and our Congress, this Congress, has failed to provide the leadership. One thing we learned from the New Year's Eve fiscal cliff negotiations is that our work to tackle our debt must begin now. It cannot wait until the 11th hour when the deadline is near and the consequences preventable. We've all heard the saying that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over but expecting different results. So why should we expect our fiscal situation to change if we keep doing the same thing? Raising the debt limit so we can borrow more money and spend more money. We know what needs to be done. It will just take the courage, the political courage, to do it. Rather than wait for another last-minute deal that gets rushed through with little input from the American people, it's time we have an open and honest debate. I think Americans are ready for leadership that involves tough decisions. The President must come to the table with Congress and put courage and common sense before politics. And that means getting serious about our government's finances. One of the best ways to rein in spending is to set a budget and live by it. No country, business, or family can operate responsibly without a budget. Crafting a budget is one of the basic responsibilities of Congress, but this Senate has not passed a budget in more than 1,300 days. 
When a Kansas family meets the max on their credit card, they don't just call the credit card company and say, would you raise my limit and keep on spending? No, they cut back spending and change their budget. Washington needs to do the same thing. I hope that the stories that the Senate is going to address a budget are true. And I hope that means that the Budget Committee will meet and in regular order deal with a budget. I'm a member of the Senate Appropriations Committee. I hope we have the opportunity to do appropriation bills that matter following that budget. We must take serious action to address this, this fiscal cliff, the real one. The $48 trillion in unfunded obligations, these programs that represent promises by the federal government have been made to Americans and must be kept. It's not about undoing Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid. It's about making certain that they are available and they are fiscally sound and that another generation of Americans can receive the benefits. Another solution besides the budget in getting our spending back under control is to consider and adopt many of the bipartisan recommendations put forth by the President's own Deficit Reduction Commission. The co-chairs of that commission have warned that if we fail to take swift and serious action, the U.S. faces the most predictable economic crisis in history. Yet the President and Senate leadership have ignored these recommendations and continue to spend borrowed money without regard for the consequences. The President's solution is to raise revenues to balance the budget, but those tax increases, if he got all he asked for, would only cover spending for just a few weeks. The President's budget that he's proposed in the four years he's been President, they all raise taxes. Every budget that the President has proposed in the four years he's been in office have raised taxes. Well, one would think maybe that means that the deficit is going down. But unfortunately, the budgets proposed by President Obama raise taxes, raise spending, and increase debt. That suggests to me that increasing taxes is never the, the solution that results in less spending and less deficits, but just increased taxes and more spending. History shows us that every time money is raised in Washington, D.C., more money is spent by Washington, D.C. The revenues we need to balance our books are not increases in taxes, but revenues coming from a strong and growing economy. To turn our economy around and put people back to work, Congress and the administration should be implementing policies that encourage job creation, rein in burdensome government regulations, replace our convoluted tax code with one that is fair and simple and certain, open foreign markets to American manufactured, and agri manufactured goods and agricultural products, and develop a comprehensive energy policy. We are not immune from the laws of economics that face every nation. The Congressional Budget Office estimates that government spending on health care entitlements, Social Security, and interest on the national debt will consume 100 percent of the total revenues generated by the federal government by the year 2025. That means the money that the government spends on national defense, transportation, veterans health care, and other government programs will have to be borrowed, driving us even further into debt. CBO issued a report last June which warned that unless we work to reduce our debt, we face the increased probability of a sudden fiscal crisis that would cause investors to lose confidence in the government's ability to manage its budget, and the government would thereby lose its ability to borrow at these affordable rates. I don't want to experience the day when our creditors decide we are no longer credit worthy and America has to suffer the, suffer the same consequences as the countries who's, who have ignored their debt crisis. We need look no further than the current situation in many countries in Europe to see what high levels of national debt will do to a country's economic health. Last week, one of the major credit rating agencies, Fitch, warned that America loses, risks the losing of its AAA credit rating if Congress and the President fail to agree to a, quote, credible, a credible medium-term deficit reduction plan. Fitch's warning is yet another reason we need to work together to put our country on a sustainable path for the future. We need to heed this warning and take steps now to prevent another credit downgrade. The American people expect the President and members of Congress to confront our nation's challenges and not to push them off to some future date. They also want their concerns and voices heard. The last-minute deals, the negotiations by a handful of peop people are very disturbing to me and to many Americans. 
I'm, today I'm pleased to share a new opportunity that gives Kansans a voice in the debate on how to reduce spending through a new website called Fight for Our Future. Kansans can access that site from my home page and learn more about the government's true fiscal condition. Not only can they share their thoughts on why we should cut spending, but they can also vote for debt reduction proposals that they think would be most effective. They will be able to add their name to a message to be sent to the President, to congressional leaders, to urge us to put our politics aside and to work to save our country's future. The debate over government spending is often seen as one that is philosophical or simply partisan bickering. All my life I've heard Republicans and Democrats arguing about spending and deficits and taxes. They just think that's what goes on in Washington, D.C., but this time it's different. And our failure to act will have dramatic consequences to the daily lives of Americans. This is about whether or not an American can find a job, afford to make payments on their home, and their cars, and whether their kids will have a bright future. The debt limit crisis we are facing now did not have to be a crisis. We knew the day would come when we would have to deal with the consequences of living beyond our means. Let's work together to solve this tremendous challenge. Madam President, I notice the absence of a quorum.